Now I'd like to welcome to the show uh, my good friend and colleague, Ryan Young, who is Senior Economist here at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Welcome to Free the Economy, Ryan. Thanks, Richard. It's good to be here. Now, I should point out that this is an emotional reunion for Ryan and I, as we previously worked together on CEI's first podcast, Liberty Week, which started all the way back in 2008. Uh, I was originally the host and Ryan was our producer. And then after I moved to the Tax Foundation, uh, it was rebranded simply as the CEI podcast and Ryan was the host. So it's it's great to be, uh, life has come full circle, Ryan. I'm going to say the production values are a lot better now. It's the, it's the It's a night and day. So... Let's roll in. We've got you've got a nice sideline these days. I think in uh, putting out expert reaction uh, when there's economic news that comes out, uh, reports on new employment numbers and things like that. How much attention should we be paying to these monthly and quarterly announcements from the Fed or the Bureau of Labor Statistics? Does it really matter to a normal person if inflation or unemployment changes by one percent? I'd say the big picture matters more. Uh, but yes, the short run does matter, especially for issues like inflation that can hit people in the pocketbook very quickly. Um, in one sense, it doesn't matter too much what this month's or what this quarter's GDP reading is. What does matter is that it's averaged more than 2% for the last century, which has tripled or even quadrupled living standards over that time. The big picture is something that I think gets lost in the news cycle. And while each new indicator that comes out itself isn't that important. It's one piece of a much larger puzzle that is very important. Now, you and your co-author, our, our colleague Ian Murray, wrote uh, two papers uh, a few years back um, that I think are, are still very much salient and current today about the question of economic inequality and what, if anything, the government should be doing about it. Um, can you tell us about the first of those, people, not ratios? What does that title mean? Uh, that paper is about income inequality, and most of the income, or most of that debate, uh, concerns the differences between rich and poor, the ratios, the mathematical ratios between high incomes and low incomes. And I think that what gets lost in that debate very frequently is very basic questions like, how are the poor doing? Are their living standards improving over time? What policies can keep those living standards improving over time? Uh, those are questions not of relative poverty, not of ratios, but about people. How are the people actually doing in absolute terms? That is a story that uh, the long run indicators that I talk about every month and every week are very important to. I think that is a theme that people need to pay more attention to. It's good to zoom out and see the big picture, not just what today's news cycle is saying. And uh, also a reference back to um, uh, the uh, famed Piketty book about from several years back about uh, uh, income inequality um, and how uh, you know a market economy supposedly you know uh, tends to create in income inequality and the um, it was the the Gini coefficient right which is that that number that economists use to uh, make comparisons about uh, inequality. Um, yeah, that number, uh, the Gini coefficient, is a standard tool for measuring ratios, for measuring inequality. Um, at one end of the Gini coefficient, uh, a society is perfectly equal, where everyone has the same income. There are no rich and there are no poor. At the other end is where one person would have all of the money and nobody would have anything else. Obviously, every real world society is in between. As it turns out, um, market-based economies tend to fare surprisingly well on the Gini coefficient. Yes, some people get richer, but it turns out the poor get much richer too. And when you look at other indicators of inequality, um, the average human grew in height by between three and four inches during the 20th century. That's not something that a hundred foot tall Bill Gates could skew an average for. <laughs> that means that the average person is getting better nutrition and better health care than their grandfathers did. That is a very important equality story that isn't being told in books like Piketty's. And another area where people are more equal is that we've moved from a society of status where you have kings and nobles who have legal and physical power over other people to a society of contract. If you sign a contract, you inherently respect another person's rights. If you trade with another person, you're saying, I'm not going to steal from you because you have rights and I'm going to respect those rights. 
So if you have something that I want, I'm going to give you something in return so we both benefit. That kind of equality did not exist back in the olden days, regardless of what any kind of Gini coefficient said. So analytically, that kind of focus on ratios and inequality is in many ways worse than useless. It's actually counterproductive for actually helping absolute poverty, for helping make people better off over time, which is the larger goal that I think all of us share. Well, yeah, because if you, you could have a, a perfectly equal society, but everyone could be so poor that they're on the edge of starvation, and that wouldn't be the kind of equality any of us would like. <laughs> That's exactly right. So, so I mentioned there were there were two papers that came out about the same time that you and Ian worked on, and I think the second of those two, uh, the Rising Tide, also included a great discussion of the minimum wage. Uh, speaking of how economic system affects people uh, at the bottom, and and what happens when the government regulates wages in general. Can you explain what we call the dynamic effects on employment, sort of other employment benefits and work conditions that happen when minimum wages get hiked, for example? Yeah, as with everything else, minimum wages have trade-offs. That's just a part of life. So minimum wages that are intended to uh, reduce poverty and make people at the bottom of the income spectrum better off, um, turns out in practice not to work that way because trade-offs get in the way. Um, one example that's often cited is, like you said, unemployment. If one person gets a raise, businesses only have so much money to spend on payroll. So if they have to give more to one person, someone else must lose their job or have their hours reduced. Um, things like that are very common. As it turns out, at the levels that we do see uh, with real world minimum wage hikes, those effects are usually very small. Um, in addition to that, employers usually also will do anything they can to not fire people. Even bosses are human beings, even if they don't always seem that way, they will do everything they can short of firing people uh, before uh, they go to that last resort. So you'll see things like uh, at, a, at a retail store, maybe the employee discount goes away. Maybe at a shopping mall, free parking goes away. Um, this happened in Seattle and that caused quite a bit of an uproar among employees. Uh, who found that even though their paycheck was getting up, their total compensation was either unchanged or in effect, went, or actually went down. Maybe you get more wages, but fewer benefits, a stingier health insurance plan or no health insurance. There are a million and one of these different trade-offs that can express themselves when a minimum wage gets raised. And it's different for every company. It's different for every worker, even inside a company. But those trade-offs are there. We can't wish them away. Uh, for every dollar that goes up for one person, it either gets eroded away through other trade-offs or it comes out of someone else's pocket. So it's at best a neutral policy. It might make the ratios look better, but on net, it's usually bad for most people. Interesting. Now, some people look at the the wages and salaries, how they're paid, and and, and feel that their that distribution is unfair. The idea that a CEO makes you know a hundred times as much as a receptionist or a janitor, for example, but I feel like often those critiques fail to consider the economic value that each employee is actually creating. There seems to be this assumption that, uh, you know, wages and salaries should be apportioned on some sort of, you know, non-economic idea of fairness, rather than at least attempting to understand what each worker is actually producing. Uh, how do economists measure that? Well, one way is to avoid the zero-sum fallacy. It's just not the case that for one per, in order for one person to have more, another person must have less. Uh, when we speak of economic growth, we mean that literally. The pie gets bigger. It doesn't matter so much how you slice it. It matters that the pie gets bigger so that everyone can have more. If a CEO uh, gets essentially paid $20 million to walk away and not do $100 million of damage to the company, um, that is an indicator of how important his decisions are to other people's well-being. So yes, it's, uh, it's unfair and it's definitely unesthetic for him to be getting that $20 million bonus to stop doing damage. Uh, but it also shows how much value a person making better decisions can be and how much better they can improve everyone else's in the company's life and their investors' lives um, in absolute terms. Uh, so between the zero-sum fallacy and more subtle, more nuanced 
uh, indicators like that, I think uh, you're onto something there. Well, the other thing I know that uh, has occurred to me, and again, you know, economists and business writers have, you know, written up this angle as well, is that a single CEO is in charge of an entire company, whereas a single frontline worker is only in charge of a very small part of a company's operations, whether that's working on an assembly line or uh, cleaning the facility or doing anything else. And that part of the reason why we have higher pay in the positions where we have the you know most notoriously high pay, whether you're a CEO or whether you're an NFL quarterback or whether you are a like pop celebrity with a number one hit, uh, a lot of it has to do with the the platform and the scope and scale that you're operating at. So if you're the CEO of a $10 billion company, uh, your efforts are spread over the entire company. And if you are being seen by you know, 20 million people on Sunday afternoon uh, playing a sport, all of those people are part of the economic value you're creating. And so when people say, oh, well, you know, why is it fair that, you know, an NBA star earns, you know, a hundred times or a thousand times as much as, you know, a school teacher? Well, a school teacher is only capable of teaching 30 students at a time, but an NBA player can entertain millions of people at a time. That's right. And it also has to do with the rarity of their skill set. How many people have as much talent as LeBron James? And not only that, how many people have that level of talent and a platform where they can broadcast that to millions of people who are each willing to to pay to receive that kind of value. Um, teaching's hard, but it's also relatively common. You think of how many NBA players there are versus how many teachers, and supply and demand tells you a lot about what kind of pay they're gonna get as well. When people become worried about unfairness in the business world and the US economy in general, uh, they often look to the Federal Trade Commission as the institution to uh, redress the problem in question. I feel like there's a bit of uh, either confusion or controversy, or maybe both uh, these days, but what is the Federal Trade Commission's actual job? And do you think that they have been faithful to that recently, or they have, have they perhaps been strained from their mission? Uh, they have two main jobs, and I don't think they've been doing that great of a job on either front. Uh, job number one is consumer protection law. Um, essentially, if a business is doing something unfair or ripping people off or committing fraud, uh, often the FTC is the agency that steps in and, and tries to make that right. Their other responsibility is antitrust policy, and that is where they've especially gone astray in recent years. Uh, in fact, the Competitive Enterprise Institute recently launched a new eye on FTC project because of how bad things have gotten at the FTC, especially on the antitrust front in the last few years. Um, the FTC is, uh, it's, it's an agency and they can only do what Congress tells them to do. That's common with a lot of parts of the executive branch. The FTC can't make a lot of rules on its own. It can only enforce the rules that have been given to it by Congress via the FTC Act uh, that passed in 1914 and also other legislation and amendments that have passed since. What we're seeing right now is that the FTC without congressional input is unilaterally increasing its, its scope and its authority, uh, applying it everywhere from, from uh, corporate mergers to an entire new vision of antitrust policy that is viewed not uh, for consumer protection, which is something the FTC is supposed to be doing, but rather more on a uh, animus towards big businesses. The, the reigning view there in current FTC leadership is that big is bad. Um, the traditional view in antitrust has been that big is okay unless it behaves badly. Um, this change in standards is a return to the antitrust policy of the 1950s and the 1960s that was so incoherent and so unworkable that the Supreme Court justice in one opinion said that the only consistency that I can see in any of this jurisprudence is that the government always wins. <laughs> that led to a fundamental rethinking of antitrust policy leading to what we now call the consumer welfare standard. Big is okay unless it does bad, then we'll enforce uh, antitrust actions against the company. Um, we do not need to go back to that old system. It was incoherent, it was unworkable, and it is a violation of the separation of powers and the FTC simply does not have the authority uh, to do many of the things it's doing. So I, uh, I think CEI's efforts will hope to shine a light on that. Wow, the FTC going beyond its uh, Congress giving boundaries, it sounds a little bit like what some of our friends at the Securities and Exchange Commission are doing these days. 
but we'll, uh, we'll we'll come back to that another time. Now, one of the hot topics in D.C. right now is the federal debt limit and the question about uh, whether uh, the current members of Congress, Democrats and Republicans, will get together as they have uh, many previous occasions to increase the debt limit, so to uh, stave off the uh, possibility of a uh, gov default in government debts. And uh, one solution, a colorful solution, I think, uh, to, to all of this problem with government debt uh, is uh, the idea that the Treasury should mint a coin, a very special coin that is worth a trillion dollars, uh, and then they should deposit the coin in the Federal Reserve. Uh, will that work? Is that is that a solution? Can we trillion dollar coin our way to prosperity? It will not work. Um, uh, there are many reasons why I'll try to be try to be brief. Um, but if you make a trillion dollars of new money without a trillion dollars of real output and the real economy to match it, you're going to get inflation. That's what happened uh, during COVID when people had to hunker down. Um, people weren't spending as much. The Federal Reserve created $5 trillion in new money. Some of that was necessary to make up the difference. Uh, when people are spending less and the velocity of money, uh, how fast each dollar gets spent and respent slows down, the Fed's supposed to print more money in order to make up the difference. They way overdid it, increasing the supply of money by 40% over two years, whereas real output over that time only increased by 4%. When you have that kind of imbalance, 40% versus 4%, you literally change the exchange rate between dollars and real goods. That's where most of our inflation came from that we've seen in the last two years. That's what happened with $5 trillion. We flirted with double digit inflation for the first time in 40 years. The trillion dollar coin would be the exact same thing. It would just be the treasury department doing it and it'd be $1 trillion instead of $5 trillion, which also brings up separation of powers concerns. The Federal Reserve is an independent central bank, at least nominally. Um, if we don't have an independent bank, if it can be controlled by the executive branch, the Treasury Department, um, in the long run, you have fewer checks and balances and you get Argentina's monetary policy where you have chronic double digit inflation. In the case of the trillion dollar coin, at a time when we're running an annual deficit of $1.4 trillion a year, um, yes, printing a trillion dollar coin would forestall the debt ceiling battle and avoid a lot of political drama and painful votes for less than a year. And then what do you do? Do you mint another coin or do you finally do the hard political bargaining that you need to do to reach some kind of a deal to raise the debt ceiling? It's not going to work. I would argue that a better approach instead of treating the symptom, um, whichever way you want to do that, would be to treat the root problem, and that is overspending. Um, it's, at some point, it's going to have to lead to entitlement reform. Social Security and Medicare combined have unfunded liabilities of over $100 trillion. That's nearly four times total GDP. Congress and the president have for decades made promises that they can't possibly keep. And at some point, they're going to have to admit it. It's going to be politically painful. It's going to be unpopular. But at some point, somebody has to do something. We can't just keep raising the debt ceiling. We can't mint trillion dollar coins. We eventually have to just retreat the root problem. If something cannot go on forever, it has to stop. Oh, a, a bracing look at our future. Um, but uh, Sleep tight. <laughs> uh, I think, I, I mean, you know, will Congress do the hard work or will they embrace the gimmicky uh, uh, get out of doing the hard work free card? Mm, I'm not sure. Uh, but I think you're right about the idea of, uh, you know, if we, you know, mint a trillion dollar coin to get, get out of having to worry about the, uh, the debt ceiling for this year, what happens next year? I mean, eventually there, you know, you'll be able to go to the bank and get a whole roll of trillion dollar coins. Um, uh, that'll be, uh, everyone, everyone in Washington, DC will have a pocket full of them walking down the street. Uh, now one final thing that I, that I wanted to, uh, to make sure to bring up. Uh, another study of yours that I've always liked uh, is the one you did with our venerable founder, Fred Smith, uh, called uh, Virtuous Capitalism, Why There Is Less Corruption in Business Than You Think. Uh, so that study included the line, in today's political environment, the question to ask is not why there is so much rent sinking, but why so little? First of all, what is rent sinking? And then why is there less corruption in rent sinking than we think? Oh, I hate economic terminology. <laughs> Rent-seeking is one of the worst. <laughs> um, 
economists have a special way of using rent, which I'm not going to go into. Rent seeking is basically seeking special favors. You can make a profit honestly in the market, or you can do rent seeking, getting special favor from the government to uh, you know, raise a tariff so that you don't have to deal with foreign competitors or require a new license for people who want to enter your market. Um, that gives you a cozy existence and high profits. Those high profits are rents. And um, with a, gosh, I don't even know what the federal budget is these days, five trillion, six trillion. Um, you have thousands of subsidy programs, a whole agency, uh, the Export Import Bank devoted to doing special favors for large aerospace companies, a small business administration taking care of smaller companies. With so many rent seeking and so many corruption opportunities, the question to ask, like you said, I guess like I said, isn't why there's so much rent seeking, it's why there's so little. It's a minor miracle that corporate welfare is only on the order of a couple hundred billion dollars. Uh, so that's something that Fred and I explored in that paper. And when it comes to, uh, say, businesses lobbying for these special favors and whatnot, you mentioned in the paper that uh, the the value of that lobbying can get uh, eroded or has to be split up between multiple beneficiaries sometimes. Sometimes, uh, of course, if you go out, you might want to lobby for a big tax break, but you might not get it. But you'd still have to pay all the all the lobbying costs. Uh, so the the sort of complicated games playing of the legislative process itself is perhaps counterintuitively to some people uh, a uh, a way of stopping even more corruption from happening. That's right. That's it's a little bit like playing the lottery that way. Um, there are a few, if any, saints in politics and many, many sinners. Uh, fortunately for the system to work reasonably well, we can all still be sinners. Um, so in a lottery model like that, where you can lobby as hard as you want to for a million dollar tax break, um, you can spend up to a million dollars, even that doesn't guarantee that you might get it. Um, if you split, split it up 10 ways where each of you spend up to $100,000, same thing applies. And even then, if there's some kind of competitive grant where one person gets the whole thing and everyone else gets nothing, you know, if there are 10 people going for that, there's a nine in 10 risk that you will get nothing for your lobbying efforts. So a lot of companies don't bother to lobby because of that in those types of situations. So it's, uh, it's one of those ways where if you look at how people respond to their incentives, um, that is one reason why there's less rent seeking. But I think ultimately a more satisfying and hopefully a more heartening um, explanation for why there's so little rent seeking compared to what we would expect is virtue. Um, there are a lot of unethical businessmen out there, but most of them are in fact ethical. They have a sense of honor about what they do. They want to make money honestly. They want to do it the right way. It's not enough to succeed in the marketplace by any means possible. Um, that's, that's not satisfying. There's little thrill from those kinds of victories. You want to do it the right way by helping people, by creating more value, by creating a better product, adding, making it better over time for a lower price than anyone else can provide. Being better is a very satisfying feeling. And that's something that entrepreneurs chase after. There are plenty who don't. There are plenty of centers in industry as well. Um, but that kind of virtue, in addition to the kind of self-interested economic explanations like the lottery model, um, I think ultimately combine to explain why there's a lot less rent seeking than we would expect and why there's, for as much corporate welfare as there is, why there isn't even more of it. Excellent. Well, now I'm inspired again. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, that brings us to the end of our interview segment. Thank you very much uh, to uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Ryan Young, for being with us. Make sure and follow him on Twitter at Reg of the Day. Uh, we'll talk to you again soon, Ryan. Thank you, Richard.